Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Uncle Daily. I'm very, very, very excited. I have a very special guest that I've been waiting for this interview for a while. You will learn a lot and think this is the dream of, uh, of for me at least, and many physicians who want to make a difference uh, by creating companies and making real difference, especially in the field of oncology. So my guest today is Dr. Petak. He's an international expert in precision oncology and molecular pharmacology of targeted therapies. He has over 25 years of experience. He's the founder and the CEO of Genomate Health, and he's the founder and the board director of Oncompass Medicine. He's an adjunct professor at the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's the lead inventor of a novel computational method published in 2021 for standardized personalized treatment recommendations that has won numerous recognitions from organizations, including Digital Europe and ASCO. Dr. Petak, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. For having me. It's a pleasure. Likewise. I want to um, start talking about one of your babies, which we were talking about earlier, Genomate. So can you explain to the audience what does Genomate do? Sure. So uh, if we want to summarize it in a, in a sentence, this is a clinically validated computational reasoning intelligence system. Uh, that means that uh, we can take uh, a complex molecular profile of a cancer sample of a, from a, of a patient, from a cancer patient, compute it, and match uh, this complex molecular profile to treatment recommendations using uh, a computational model, a computational method. We can use uh, call it artificial intelligence, but the point is that uh, we created a mathematical model. Uh, we have been able to validate that really maximizes the chance that we make the right decision um, when we try to find the most likely effective molecularly targeted therapy for our cancer patient. Gotcha. And um, can we talk through like the steps? Like, let's say I'm an oncologist in the clinic and I, I want to order a report uh, or I'm a patient. So how the, what are the steps to get to the results that Genomate provides? Sure. Uh, so very practically, um, uh, if the patient already has uh, molecular diagnostic tests ready, typically including uh, at least one um, next generation sequencing based molecular profiling test, there are many, many vendors just I, I can I can uh, name few foundation medicine or Tempus or Caris. So these companies create great molecular diagnostic tests and they test hundreds of genes at the same time. And so um, typically they identify uh, a, an average four or five driver alterations, driver genetic alterations per patients, and they create a report on these alterations. Um, and also the same patient may have other tests, single gene tests uh, using PCR or FISH or immunohistochemistry. So the, may, the same patient can have also PDL1 immunohistochemistry results. And, and maybe the same patient will have multiple other test results, even NGS, like maybe another uh, a liquid biopsy-based test as well. Um, uh, from garden, for example, and then so you 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 sit in front of your patient and you have all these reports with, mm -hmm. and each will have list different uh, list of alterations, and in these reports um, are created uh, uh, by softwares using softwares that use knowledge bases to actually interpret these genetic alterations. So you know, so you have a re in these reports, you also see which is a, a pathogenic driver, what is a, which one is a variant of unknown significance. And, and, and if there is a matching therapy, or you also see uh, the therapy that is matched. Now, the problem is that 
Of course, um, these reports um, link these genetic alterations to different therapies separately, one by one. So one alteration to one treatment option. Usually, and, and the level of the connection is based on um, the, the reference the, the a scientist found who built the knowledge base. And mm-hmm. so, um, and we know this ESCOT and other recommended ways to tear uh, um, these um, connections. But the problem is that it's extremely confusing that you have multiple uh, treatment alterations and then uh, in, in multiple tests. But you as an oncologist, you have to make your final decision uh, based on the totality of the molecular information you know about the patient. And each gene or genetic alteration can be linked to multiple treatment options, and each treatment option can be linked to multiple uh, genetic alterations in the same patient. So how how can you make the final decision? And so, so all these... Uh, test results are the inputs of our system. So you can use it with them and uh, you can upload the reports to a secure HIPAA compliant portal. And um, we send you back the genomic report and you also can log in in, into our interactive portal where you can also um, explore um, the thinking process of the a computational method, uh, uh, and and it will rank treatment options based on a score, or genomic score. It's it's an actual mathematical and a number um, calculated by the system. So each treatment option uh, has a, a score. Uh, scientifically, we call them call this score uh, aggregated evidence level or AEL. And, um, and the whole model uh, is called uh, a digital drug assignment system. Um, and the whole logic is that um, you have a very easy to understand objective ranking of treatment options that 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 are uh, assigned to the the totality of the molecular profile, the whole molecular profile. So what is the final? inference what's the final conclusion for this patient uh based on the all the alterations so um so in a nutshell uh this is how you can already use it uh we already uh set up pilots and collaborations and um but our ultimate vision is to create um a companion diagnostic software platform out of this and uh, really uh make this dream come true that we physicians, oncologists, and healthcare providers, we can provide this N of one precision therapy. We all dream about this. This we we talk about a lot, but the difficulty is that without a validated new type of medical device that has been validated to uh, an evidence-based to provide uh, the right N of one therapy, it's we cannot really practice precision medicine in reality. So when we talk about precision oncology or precision medicine, um, we usually think about this, think about therapies that have a companion diagnostic test that is a molecular diagnostic test as a approved as a companion diagnostic predictive uh, test, but it is not precision oncology because that is just an, as a biomarker that has been used to select patients to a clinical trial. And it's proven that patients who carry this biomarker have a higher statistical chance to respond to that targeted therapy. But the difficulty is that the same patient will have on average four other biomarkers as well. And so 
so so each patient so we, we create this we, we conduct these clinical trials by selecting um inclusion criteria and to try to make a homogeneous uh, population of patients and then we try different drugs in this population but um the problem is that in 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 oncology in precision oncology we know that on the molecular level cancer is so heterogeneous that actually the number of molecular subgroup group groups are enormous so so even even if the patients share the same biomarker um you you don't really know that if your patient uh, should benefit the most from a therapy against one or the other biomarker in in his tumor um I, I give you a very a simple example that is widely known by by oncologists the situation so when you have a breast cancer patient who is BRCA mutant you know, and it's metastatic you know that there are PARP inhibitors approved uh, great and we also know that um HER2 positive uh, overexpressing breast cancers also uh, benefit from HER2 inhibitors. We have difficulty. Now, so what happens if you are presented uh, uh, a patient who is BRCA mutant and HER2 positive? So it's rare, but it happens. It that happens, yeah. Happens. So that then we need a randomized clinical trial to compare HR2 inhibitors and PARP inhibitors in this population. Which is very hard to do because those are already rare patients. They're already rare. And 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 on, on top of that, that it's just a current case, uh, 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 um, 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 a case we had, of course, and other than these two mutations or alterations, the patient will have other two, three, four other uh, alterations like MIC amplification. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so do we know how what are you gonna do with that? How do, what, do, what, what to do with this information? So is the MIC amplification will increase or decrease the chance to respond to the PARP inhibitors or to the HR2 inhibitors? So so maybe if we knew that the MIC amplification causes resistance to to one or the other, to the PARP inhibitor, the HR2, so then, then we, it would be easy to make the decision that okay. Even if this is an HR2 positive cancer, we would use the PARP inhibitor first uh, for this case. But and then, but of course, there's a clinical trial for patients with MIC amplification. Okay, but should I send my patient to this trial? Because I should know that maybe the HR2 amplification causes resistance to MIC inhibitors. So then. Okay, so, so so that's the, so actually at the end of the day, we need we, we theoretically we need evidence for each molecular subtype, for each combination of of mutations. And so the, the, we have only seven hundred cancer genes, around seven hundred according to Cosmic. That doesn't sound to be a lot. It's not really mm -hmm. scary. Um, we have 25,000 genes, and in the past 20 years, we conducted this uh, um, systematically the uh, Cancer Atlas Genome Project. And in 2020, there was a great paper from this uh, huge uh, consortium of whole genome sequencing of uh, thousands of tumors, and they reported that now we can identify the genetic cause of cancer in 95% of cancer patients. So actually, we can find a driver, at least one driver, in ninety-five percent of cancer. So we we are wow. reaching plateau, of course, yeah. not because uh, Human Genome Project was twenty years ago. So and we are running out of genes. We are running out of cancer genes. We, we we need millions of years to make a new gene. So that so that's the good news that. It's a closed box. It's a there are countable number of genes, countable number of cancer genes. The problem is that seven hundred with the seven hundred is that it's more than hundred. So if it's more than hundred, the average frequency is less than one mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. uh, and then on top of it, you have the different type of mutations in the same gene genes. 
So, and then on top of it, you have the combinations. Combination? No. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree with that. It's like it's like 700 for the power of, I don't know which number, uh, because like you can come up with many, many different combinations. And I, I think this is a problem that we all run into, right? So you send one of the, you, you send the tissue molecular test and it might come negative or positive. And then you send the circulating tumor DNA and it might come disconcordant showing another mutation. And then like you have, okay, so what should I do now? W which one should I guide my treatment? And like the example that you gave, it's something that we run into. Okay, so we have those two mutations. Um, how, how do they interact? What should I use? Like, should I use uh, X drugs or Y drugs, right? So I think th th these are all valid problems that we go through in the clinic as an oncologist and trying to practice precision medicine. Um, it, it is very frustrating. I'm happy that you are creating a solution that can consolidate uh, all the results from, because I also do believe that as human beings, we can't really retain and process the amount of information that is being released every day when it comes to precision medicine, the different genes, the different treatments available. It's, it's crazy. It's beyond our capacity. And that's why we create things that help us like Genomate. Absolutely. So it's, I think just we have to embrace ourselves to a new generation of uh, medical devices, software as a medical devices. And right. so the, uh, and, and the good news is that uh, patients seem to like this. So, so the, so the idea that the oncologist uh, uses an AI to augment his, his uh, ability or chance to make the right decision or uses different type of softwares in, in different type of situations, um, it just sounds very logical. So the ultimately, um, what I think, what the evolution of medicine dictates us that after decades of research to understand the biology of the human body, to understand the biology of cancer and having 30 plus million PubMed articles and also our ability to to actually uh, measure uh, biomedical parameters and do whole genome sequencing for a thousand dollars or or less so these we generate all this data and we are now digitalizing everything and so we have a lot of parameters as an input and we have multiple treatment options that's the what the good news that we have over 200 targeted therapies approved by fda to choose from yeah so, yeah uh, our toolbox is huge now so the, the whole, the input and the output possibilities are great. And yes. so the, 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 the number of variations, I mean, possibilities is, is exponential. So the problem mm -hmm. is the exponentiality, the nature of this. So when I graduated almost 30 years ago, and I went to medical conferences first, um, we had like a dozen tumor type and a dozen chemotherapies. So we compared all the chemotherapies to each other in randomized clinical trials in all tumor types. And that yeah. was, so, but when if years came by and I saw that, oh, oh now we have 20 drugs and we, we subcategorized the tumors based on immunohistochemistry. And now we have a hundred tumor types and we have a hundred therapies. I, I, Exactly. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. Every cancer, and that's what I tell all my patients, like every cancer is an orphan disease. Like no cancer is like the other. And you have to know what makes each cancer and each patient different and unique. Like none of the cancers are similar to each other. Absolutely. I want to shift gears a bit and talk about your paper, which is like, it's very interesting. So in 2021, 2022, you published a paper in Nature about computational method for prioritizing targeted therapy in precision oncology and performance analysis in the Shiva 01 trial. So since now we understand how Genomate works, I want to go to your paper and tell me a bit about the what type of study was it and what were the main results if, page, if physicians are using a computational method to choose the right treatment, what are the outcomes when it comes to the PFS OS that we could expect when using software to guide our treatment? So um, 
So yeah, I said, I, uh, we are very proud of this paper because I think this is the first paper, according to my knowledge, that proves that using a computational method, we can improve our chances to uh, use the right personalized therapy when we try to implement the concept of precision oncology. So, uh, so the the data we use was um, uh, created by by. Uh, Christoph um, Tourneau and his team at the uh, uh, Institute of Curie in Paris, and he was really a pioneer of precision oncology. And that this SHIVO-1 uh, was the first randomized uh, clinical trial in precision oncology. So, so basically, um, that molecular tumor board selected um, uh, drugs based on the molecular profile of the patients out of mm -hmm. 11 drugs they, they uh, uh, had. And so each patient, and the in, so they predefined uh, biomarkers as the uh, inclusion criteria, as an inclusion criteria for them. So, so genetically, all patients who were included in this clinical trial was treated with a matching therapy. So because that was the inclusion criteria to have an actionable biomarker. Mutation, yeah. Actual mutation. So and so, what they could achieve is a fifty-six percent um, overall response rate, which you can. It's it's a it's a bottle of water half a <laughs> full <laughs> and half exactly. Half... But also like taking into account that you have different and heterogeneity in cancer types and their targeted therapies too. So this was a solid. It, it was, um, of course, uh, very late stage patients after multiple lines of therapies, and uh, different solid tumors, and uh, so what? What? So I just really uh, uh, tell you the exciting part that when we uh, reanalyze this molecular profiles of these patients and ask the our model. A computation model uh, to predict whether the therapy the patient received would work or not, uh, we could uh, identify patients who had a much higher chance to uh, benefit from these matching therapies and those who did not uh, benefit. So patients who received the targeted therapy that was also supported by the model uh, had like 69% uh, uh, response rate and those who were predicted to be non-effective is for 17 percent now the difference is fourfold and the also it's exciting because the on the other arm of this clinical trial the average uh, response rate to chemotherapies chosen by the uh, the oncologists were also around 50 percent so basically uh, this computation model could have helped this oncologist already to predict whether the patient would benefit more from a, 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 a just an off-label treatment based on the presence of uh, the molecular profile or from chemotherapy, so um, and so I think and and the the of course the reason why the model was better is because the model took into account the all the mutations for each patient. So even gotcha. if so is. So, because the whole concept that you um, make your decision based on the presence of a single biomarker, a single gene. So, so the pre, our, our how we practice precision oncology, you take, okay, I'm looking for patients with PI3I, PI3K um, mutations because I have a PI3K inhibitor. And I, I don't care if the same patient has K, also KRAS mutation, HR2 amplification, whatever. I just look for patients with the PI3 kinase mutations. I mean, that's right. That's what we do sometimes, or most of the times in the clinic. But you should not be surprised that you have a very heterogeneous response to your targeted therapy if you um, base your decision on the presence of just one gene, although you know that each patient will have three, four, five, six other mutations. So that's the that's the difficulty. So so when we practice um, precision oncology in a sense where we want to really uh, choose a therapy based on the molecular profile of the patient, um, we 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 must be able 
to choose which gene to target. We must be predict. But if you have five genetic alteration in your foundation medicine report and you have three drugs, uh, drugs for three out of the five, you have to know which if any of the three drugs will be effective as a monotherapy in even in the presence of the other four. Uh, or you need a combination therapy. If you need a combination therapy, which uh, therapy to combine? Or you have to just you just you have to make the decision that you 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 must use a chemotherapy because today we don't have the right targeted therapy for this patient, and the patient would benefit from chemotherapy more. So and and the whole concept of precision oncology, what is so beautiful about it is that we we think that theoretically we should be able to reason this out because the whole concept of precision oncology is that we understand the biological significance function of these cancer genes and we know the molecular mechanism of action of our targeted therapies so because by definition we know the targets of the targeted therapies so so the whole concept of precision oncology that's why i, I became in uh, fond of this and, and in love that we 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 could use our common sense to treat these patients and um and the and the difficulty is is just is the is the number is the number the, the, the level of complexity is a mathematical problem and uh, that's so exciting that now we can uh, detect all the driver mutations in our patients because we have the um, the, we have the tools and the tools and we have and now so what what i really hope is is that um with with solutions like ours we can really um practice precision oncology in our everyday clinical practice uh, and uh, for our patients. And also what I really hope to accelerate the clinical development of drugs, um, because we, we will be able to select patients to clinical trials that not only are likely to benefit, but patients who most likely benefit the most from that therapy compared to other treatment options. Because that's the difficulty is is to find the niche of each drugs to know which are the patients who are benefiting more from this drug than another drug, without doing the all the possible randomized trials that we cannot do for all these subtypes, and um, so ultimately uh, the vision is that um, we will have this companion diagnostic. Uh, AI guided drug assignment algorithms, uh, and then we will know in which indication we should use which one, uh, because there will be clinical trials, because we already have this clinical trial data published, but we will sure we want to much more. And we also embrace a future where others will have other solutions similar to our, and I'm just really looking forward to have randomized clinical trials again, but not yeah, against oncology. comparing drugs, but to compare comparing softwares. Comparing softwares. So we that will have, be very, very cool. We will have trials again, but just comparing drug assignment algorithms to each other. So you want to know in how much percent of patients um, the, the the software chooses the right therapy in one arm and 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 the other arm. And this is what also our patients want to know, by the way. They are not interested in, 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 in the uh, clinical trial data of the drug, how much percent of patients responded to this drug you are recommending to the patient. They want to really know is your ability as an oncologist to choose the right drug for them. Them, exactly. 100% I agree. Like, no one cares about the average. Like, 50% of the patient responded, well, does that mean like, what are my chances? 50, 50, it's just like flipping a coin, right? Am I going to be the 50 that will respond to the treatment or am I going to be the 50 that will not respond? And what we tell patients, we don't know. And that's the frustrating part. We just like throw this drug. It might work or it might not work. It's, it's frustrating from both ends, like the patient and the physician. And I share your frustration. 
Um, so if I'm, I'm going to summarize, I have the trial open here in front of me and I went through it several times. And for people like want to read the trial, we're going to leave the, we're going to leave the uh, link in the comments. Uh, if, if I'm going to make it simple, I would say using genome AIDS software to choose the right drug for patient increase progression free survival duration. Is that right? Yes, even even so we could um, um, prove a statistical significant uh, difference in terms of progression for survival in this trial. Also, the absolute numbers were just few months, but um, but even that was significant. Um, despite of the low number, it was like hundred and twelve patients, and but still um, uh, the difference was so big that it became statistically significant. Of course, that was the first paper we published on this, and I really want to embrace it because it just shows that the concept works. We know that the precision oncology works. So mm -hmm. I, I first ago, I, I, I was in the team, I'm very proud of, uh, of a lung cancer patient who had EGFR mutations, and uh, we organized a single patient clinical trial for this patient based on the presence of the uh, activating mutations in the epidermal growth factor receptor before it, there was any publication suggesting that there is a link. So that was just pure intuition. I mean, it's not rocket science. I mean, there was a lung cancer, exactly. EGFI mutation, and it, also it was helpful that she also had an amplification of the uh, gene. So when mm -hmm. you have this, 100 copy of a, a mutant allele, that's very suspicious. And, and then you just, your reasoning is just that, okay, then maybe I should tease this patient with an inhibitor of this growth factor receptor who has been amplified 100 times in this patient. I mean, it's like, I mean, the usually example I say is that when you see, uh, as an example that um, imagine that you are in an ER and, and there's a patient comes to you who complains up for, uh, about headache and you go closer and you see that there's a big nail in his head. So so what would you do? And then I, of course, I always joke that, of course, you treat for migraine um, because that's the most <laughs> common cause of uh, headaches. So. Headache. That's, that's that's evidence based. So so, but now that in oncology we see the nails, before exactly, we did, I but, agree. <laughs> that was and, a good example. Then we don't want to ignore that, and um, and that was and we and then that patient had a complete response and um, had lived tumor free for five years, and so this was a transforming, uh, of course, um, event in my life and career when I saw the power of uh, precision oncology or using uh, the right targeted therapy that can really eliminate um, the multiple metastatic sites in a, in a patient. So we, we, at that time, we were very skeptic that, I mean, cancer is a very complicated disease, heterogeneous, multiclonal, uh, and all that, and multiple sites, but using just a targeted therapy, the whole system can collapse if it's the right one. And so the, we know that the, the concept works. We know that <clears throat> many patients respond very well. Is the, the frustration is that we cannot expand this to, to more patients. And, um, and, the, and, then the, and the reason is, is just simply, uh, it's just a bit more complicated. So the patients comes in, they have a lot of nails. Many are passenger nails. <laughs> So they are there, but they don't cause headache. They don't anything, exactly. And then, and then you have four or five nails with different who actually contribute to the headache. And then you have to make a decision on the ER quickly, which nail to pull out first. Now it's getting complicated. Now then, but of course, with the, we, we have such a detailed knowledge of the anatomy of the patient. So, so we know where then nerves are going and how we see how, and we can do a, uh, uh, like a CT and see how deep the nails go in and which one touches which nerve. And and then, sure, I mean, it's an imaginary. Uh, uh, no, like, but this is a great example. And this is like, it is exactly what we, we, we deal with in the clinic, right? Like multiple mutations, multiple 
uh, for, uh, discrepancies between the tissue testing and the blood testing, and then like good luck choosing the right one. Um, it's 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 very hard. Uh, for the sake of time, I want to shift gears and I want to talk more about you. And like, I'm very impressed right now by Genomate, but like, I do believe that you also have so much value to teach like uh, younger generation oncologists about like where you are and uh, where have you been and where you are right now. Um, can you talk to me through your early residency and training uh, days? Uh, what made you like pursue? Let's start, what made you pursue a career in oncology? And then we can go to uh, the precision medicine. Sure. Um, so I, 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 so if I really want to go back, sorry for just very briefly to even my to childhood, uh, when I, when I uh, uh, first received uh, from my parents a tortoise uh, and I had to take care of that animal and I didn't know what to do. And I went to the library and I borrowed a book about the, um, Terror, uh, how to um, uh, keep uh, animals like tortoises, and I, I learned that it was a testudo hermaning melin in Latin, and 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 you learned what kind of food uh, that that tortoise likes, and I really that from that I really became fond fond of this idea that by just knowing things we can save lives, and 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 um, and understanding how nature works, we can save lives, and. And when I graduated from the med school and I went to pediatric oncology first, that, that, that was the um, ultimate challenge, I think, where, where, uh, for a doctor to work with uh, um, young um, children with cancer. And at that time, um, uh, also one of my tasks was to treat patients with the acute lymph with leukemia, ALL. And at that time, in 95, we already knew that 5% of ALL patients actually harbor the Philadelphia chromosome, the bcr able translocation. And those patients had a worse prognosis. They didn't exactly. risk well to chemo. And it was frustrating that we had to give the same chemotherapy protocol, and we knew that they would die. So I took blood from these patients, and I took it to the molecular pathology department, isolated the cells, and try to find ways to kill these cells. And that was the down of uh, apoptosis research. And we started to understand that the life and death of cells are molecular is molecularly regulated. So it's an active response to, to these therapies. And we also knew at that time that PCR-enabled fusion protein is the actual cause of cancer in this patient. So if you put this fusion gene into a mouse, the mouse develops leukemia and uh, amazingly. And of course, in vitro, if you use antisite and oligonucleotides to silence the gene, this, this leukemic cells stop growing. So this, this is the nail. That's what is a big nail there. And, and <laughs> stating in, in 95 that we, we didn't have the tool to pull it out. So we had to wait until 2000 when imatinib uh, was approved and th thank you. Yes, I know. Uh, the uh, switch from interferon to imatinib, eh? Imatinib. So imatinib was like a, a very a breakthrough. And the good news is that not just for CML patients, but also for these children with ALL, now they receive imatinib and then they can survive. So, uh, and then, so that years, um, and then I was really lucky. I went to research in molecular pharmacology of this therapies and I was studying signal transaction pathways and understand to understand um, how cell growth and cell death is regula regulated and to choose the right targets. And that's when I went to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital for five years. And I, I did research there and uh, published papers on, on the apoptotic pathways. And then, and this was really, um, exciting to see that how big differences are in drug sensitivity between cell lines. So it was obvious that it would be the same in um, practice. If we want to use targeted therapies, it's not like chemotherapy that is dose dependent. For targeted therapies, what you see is that either they work or not. Or they not work, yeah. And, and, and so it, it, it was obvious that we must have the tools 
to detect these genetic alterations, we, and we must have the tools to predict whether that particular patient will respond to, to our therapy or not. Otherwise, we will not be able to use uh, these targeted therapies. And, um, and this is why I decided, when I decided to uh, start my first company with my classmate from uh, Semmelweis uh, 21 years ago, uh, that the, we started to develop the first molecular diagnostic tests like, like for EGFR. And, and then in 15 years ago, we started NGS in 2008. And, and, and then when we started to see that patients have not just one alteration is just of one nail, but multiple. And so then this is when we started to understand that we would need a third innovation. So now we have the ability to uh, detect these mutations. We have the ability to, to uh, develop molecularly targeted therapies. That's now also a, a enabled by AI, AlphaFold and other fantastic innovations. And so we need a third class of tools, these the treatment selection computational tools or AI-guided drug assignment algorithms that actually match uh, um, the, these complex molecular profiles, individual combinations of mutations to the right targeted therapy. And then we'll have everything. The, all the three classes of tools, like in exactly. Harry Potter, you all the three <laughs> <laughs> we need to conquer conquer that and conquer cancer. I want to go back a bit about um, when the early days when you started transitioning from clinician to an entrepreneur. How was it? Like, how did you know what to do? Like, when you when you say that you started a next generation sequencing company, like uh, there is a lot when it comes to that. It's not easy. It's a full time job. Like, it requires like fundraising bringing machines and working, building teams. So how were those early days and how did you learn to start the companies? So so first of all, I, I had to make the decision that uh, I want to create tools other doctors can use. Um, that was, was one. Although I really loved to work with patients um, but I, I thought that um, my mission is to develop new technologies for other doctors to be more successful. Uh, that was the first decision. And then another one was when uh, we discovered the first uh, cancer genes and understood the biology of cancer. I saw how difficult to translate this knowledge into clinical practice, how long it takes. And, and it was just unbearable for me that we already know the solution is published and it's not used in clinical practice. And, and I, understand, I understood that um, it's, because it's, it's a very complicated multi-step process from the scientific discovery until we really can use in clinical practice a new innovation, a new diagnostic method or a new therapy. And, um, and the bridge is 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 a innovation driven enterprise or biotech company or med medical technology company so between the uh, basic research and practice and and actually 80% of drugs we use today are developed by small biotech companies i don't know if you know this number so large pharma companies buy these little companies they up. acquire them yeah they acquire them and but there is an innovation um, pipeline, and uh, there is a very important role for these medtech and biotech companies who really translate research to a practical tool, a medical device. Or and so I was, I'm, I'm so excited, and um, I really enjoy working on uh, how to, on, on this problem, how to accelerate this translation of the scientific discoveries into clinical, the useful tools. And um, so that's why I became an entrepreneur. And <clears throat> but I think scientific research is really close to entrepreneurship is because it's about doing something new to, tr to try to uh, address an unmet medical need or an unmet and it need with a completely new way, you don't really know that it's gonna work or not. 
and uh, and uh, it's, it's extremely stressful on on one hand uh, and but very exciting on the other hand so i think it's not really entrepreneurship is not really far away from uh, research and um, discovery and uh, clinical research also so um of course, the there are a lot of things I had to learn about the business side, um, but I have a team who support me, and it, I also love to love this um, uh, opportunity to build your own team and create a uh, a new entity from nothing, a new uh, society of humans working together synergistically to create something we could not create individually but we can create together and it's so beautiful so i, I really enjoy this part um but of course it's exhausting um how to balance between fundraising and research and uh, and the team uh, uh lead the team but um but i think uh being part of the uh, story where when actually we see patients um, responding to therapies better uh, thanks to tools we created, I think it's really rewarding at the end. I love that. No, I completely agree with you. I think um, I agree with you. The point of research is very similar to entrepreneurship because like, you have to build a team also when you're writing a research paper. You have to come up with different ideas. You have to have proper methods. Right, um, agree. I mean, right it's, again, and then you need the budget, and, and yeah, it's similar. It's, it sounds far away, but it is not. It's very. Um... <laughs> it, it it is different in different ways. Uh, so you mentioned that learning about the side of business, and this is something we don't learn in medical school. Uh, do you have any recommended books or courses for, like, let's say, someone is like they have an idea and they want to like start building something big, like you did? what they should read, what they should learn? Uh, so I, I didn't have any formal training in business, so I don't have an MBA. Uh, so we gradually grew. So we started out our startup 20 years ago, just two of us with my friend, and then gradually uh, had some colleagues. And um, uh, so I, I learned by doing so i think you i think if you are um if you want to be an entrepreneur with a md background or phd background uh you just need the right um advisors so you need the first of all the right team so some co-founders who maybe your co-founder can be somebody who has a business background that's that's the best and then um and uh, but also if you have find angel investors uh, who can really be also your advisors that's that's very important and and before you go to vcs uh, and uh, so i think uh, these are advices um of course there are so many courses out there and books and i also of course i was in, inspired by uh books like um um deals uh from zero to one and and of course the life of steve jobs and 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 all, all that um is inspiring and also there is a, a great book I, I just got from from an mit course the um disciplined entrepreneurship or maybe if i want to advertise one it's it's a very it's 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 very pragmatic as just the title also yeah <laughs> that's, that's, no i completely agree with you i think one of the biggest problems entrepreneurship face is like how to discipline you have tons of ideas how to stick to one and this yes and uh systematically build up your um strategy um but um yes and and of course you just mentioned the focus so let's knock it on wood i mean you have to you have to focus but you have to focus on the problem you want to solve you so I, I love this say, saying that you you must be in love with the problem you want to solve and not with the solution interestingly mm -hmm. so that's 
So I as I decided this from the beginning that I, I'm working on a problem and not, and I will develop the tools how to achieve my goal. Uh, so I I decided 30 years ago that as a scientist, physician scientist, I will focus on a single problem, and that is the uh, precision oncology, how to match the right targeted therapy uh, to every cancer patient based on the individual molecular profile of their cancer. So on this nail problem. So why don't we cannot just really treat every patient based on the understanding of the cancer genetics? So we should be able, and why we don't? And at the beginning, I so that was always the goal. And then of the beginning, I was focusing on technologies that enabled us to detect these mutations. And then I switched to computational uh, methods when I when I realized that this is what we need to get closer to our dream. So, so, and, 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 and when we, and it's also in general, it's, it's, it's that this is what they say that when you develop a, a, a product, you need market feedback and you, we have to be ready to change and pivot. You see, you always pivot your strategy. You don't yeah. pivot. Yeah. Oh. That's the only print, but you focus on the the goal, what you where you want to get to the if it's a Himalaya in the Mount Everest or whatever, you just want to get to the top. But on, on your way, you go around uh, glaciers and rock falls, and and then you you think that you know the path, but you it's a dead end. You still have to start again. So you have to be ready to uh, pivot and adapt. Uh, but never, never change your goal because if you do have too many goals, if so, you have to find. There's another saying I love: you have to find your and and choose your battle. Exactly, if, you can't go into every war. You cannot win all the battles of 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 the world, but you can choose one battle if you fight long enough. And. Um, but you you want, you have to be ready to use whatever tools you need to achieve this goal. So I think that's in nutshell what I learned in my past uh, decades. Awesome, great, thank you so much, Dr. Petak. That was very, very, very insightful, and we will make sure to leave the link of the paper and um, other resources like the book you mentioned, maybe in the comments below, so people can uh, read and the paper. Uh, it's very interesting and it's uh, it, it is very also like I'm very optimistic about the future of precision medicine, especially when we bring softwares and computers to help oncologists to make decisions. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.